All right. Well, welcome and thank you again for joining us today. We're kicking off the second episode of Merging Domain. We will be bringing new CICD related content every month. Uh, so we hope you enjoy today's session and make sure to check out our future sessions as well. Just a quick reminder that today's session is interactive. So please feel free to submit any questions. The Q&A will be open uh, and we'll do our best to answer them live. For this episode, we are very fortunate to, to have two very experienced engineers from Intuit joining us today, Anusha Ragunathan and Kevin Downey. Anusha is a principal software engineer at Intuit, where she works on building and maintaining the company's Kubernetes-based compute infrastructure. She's passionate about solving complex problems and systems and infrastructure engineering. Prior to Intuit, she worked on building distributed systems at Docker and VMware, and her interests include containers, virtualization, and cloud-native technologies. Uh, so definitely uh, the, the triple threat there. Kevin is a staff software engineer at Intuit. He's a core contributor to the Kiko project and Intuit and the Kubernetes service as well. Kevin enjoys solving platform scale problems in systems and infrastructure engineering. His interests include containers, virtualization, cloud native technologies, and dogs. And uh, from what he said, he loves to be the tip of the spear and do a lot of the implementation stuff. Uh, so without further ado, Kevin, Anusha, you ready to get started? Yep. Yeah, thank you, Bradley. All right, yeah, let's go for it. Um, so this should be a fun one. So, you know, the title of this is obviously, is GitOps a fad? Uh, I think it's an interesting question and we're gonna get to that very question, but I, but I think it's just, it's a cool topic because I think there are a lot of people on the sidelines. You know, they're, they're very interested in GitOps, but they're kind of waiting to see, is this the right time to jump in? Uh, what does it mean for my company? What does it mean for my teams? So we're hoping to tackle some of that. And Intuit is probably the perfect group of folks to talk to. And uh, Anusha and Kevin bring a wealth of experience in this area. So I'm looking forward to just kind of expanding on this conversation. So I guess just to kick it off, Anusha, you know, what does GitOps mean at Intuit? Thank you for the introduction. Um, before we get started on answering that, um, I just want to uh, preface that by saying at Introvert, we are a pretty advanced cloud native shop and uh, we've adopted some of the bleeding edge technologies way before um, way before my time here, which is about three years now. And, um, and uh, when I joined Introvert, I was actually very pleasantly surprised about the speed and the agility of how, how well they have adopted a lot of the technologies that are still pretty primitive in uh, they're open to experimentation about about a lot of things. Um, having said that, um, GitOps actually at Intuit is 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 the is the mechanism for software delivery, whether it's services, whether it's uh, cluster management, whether it's anything that manages the platform. We use GitOps. We are a huge uh, Argo CD shop, and for those who are not aware. Intuit is one of the core contributors. In fact, it, Intuit incubated Argo CD as a project, um, and now it's a graduated uh, CNCF project. And um, we use it heavily for delivering any kind of software across the stack. And it sort of helps us in our big mission. So Kevin and I are part of this big platform team, and the main mission for us is to help our 6,000 plus uh, app de developers uh, have increased uh, developer velocity so they can actually um, bring their service the, from code to production. It, it just gets faster and faster. So that's like a small, uh, faster loop. Um, so GitOps is like everything for us in, in, <laughs> at Intuit. Yeah. So it's really the core of like your existence from a CI CD, from a software delivery perspective, right? Um, and, and as you said, I think that's one of the things here, you know. Yes, you guys are extremely advanced users, but that also means that you've been there for the whole journey, right? So you saw it from GitOps kind of early days with Argo into where you're at today. Uh, now, I know, so let, let's just hit the, the hot topic here. So let's hear it. Is GitOps just a fad? Um, and I mean, outside of the Intuit bubble, do you feel like GitOps is a fad? Is it something, you know, that is going to pass and there's the next hot thing in a few years? What do you guys think? I, I can start off and then I'll, uh, Kevin can chime Please. in. Uh, uh, so so it's not a fad, definitely not serious business. Um, and, and 
if you are in the cloud native space, if you are in an agile um, environment and you want faster software delivery, um, then you're going to have a lot of moving parts. And if a velocity in change management and config management is your primary goal, then having it centrally, like the whole concept of GitOps is, you know, you have, uh, let's say, infrastructure as code, for example, you you build upon having your infrastructure defined as code and you're in, in, in some source control, but then it doesn't stop with that. GitOps actually takes that and then it enables uh, engineers to basically get it peer reviewed, uh, be able to merge and eventually deliver it and automate all of that, right? If you had to do any of this manually, it's going to slow you down. And yeah. it's also prone to human errors, like we all know. And so building it in an automation pipeline, it's um, it's, uh, it's it's almost necessary uh, and in this day and age when we are building, working on microservices and cloud native uh, infrastructure. Yeah, Kevin? automating all the things, right? <laughs> what, yeah, what's I your thoughts, to, Kevin? Yeah, I have to agree with that. Anusha said that, you know, you want to automate as much as possible. Uh, you want to also have security. You want to have auditable, auditable uh, you know, commits. Essentially, you want to know who who's committed that and why and what the change actually is. I think GitOps definitely is solving all of those things for us. And I, do, I can't say us moving away or anybody else. Like if you're trying to solve the same thing, you're going to repeat the same thing. You're going to be basically parallel to what GitOps already provides you. Yeah. Uh, I think the main thing we do use for security as well, we scan a lot of the changes there. So that's the source of truth. And we know what, what people, what images are being used, right, and deployed. We, we have in cluster and also GitOps uh, scanning tools. So yeah, it, uh, it solves everything from our needs uh, uh, close to the source of truth as possible is what we like to do. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like from my perspective, you know, when people talk about, well, you know, should we do GitOps? And, and I often just think back to, you know, what is GitOps helping companies enable? And a lot of times it's better practices around to your point, having that digital paper trail around having the single source of truth around automating things that previously, you know, sometimes are manual processes or people processes um, in general. And, and so I think even if things were to take a different name than GitOps, those best practices that are instilled from this agile development and delivery process are going to stick. Um, so do I think it's a fad? No, I, I don't think it's a fad. I think it's a current hot item. Uh, I don't think it's going away, but I'm not sure you know, what 10 years from now looks like. But in my opinion, it's, it's, it's here to stay for sure. And I think we'll see more and more adoption. Um, you so talk for chat GPT will be the next hot item. Yeah, chat GPT is going to do your delivery for you. Actually, it's fine. They'll do the build and delivery process. Uh, it'll be different every time, you know, but it keeps it interesting. Yeah, so chat ops. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so let's, uh, this is kind of interesting, because you know, you had mentioned Anusha, you know, you've been there three years, but you know, Intuit has been involved in GitOps and Argo for quite a bit longer than that. Now, Kevin, I know you've been there, is it 10 years at this point? Um, and you actually were there when uh, Intuit acquired Athletics, and you basically took in a lot of that Argo expertise. What really led to that purchase? And, and did that make significant changes inside of Intuit when you did that? Oh, yeah. From the, you know, from my perspective, you know, we, we had a bunch of platform groups and they were kind of spread out, distributed and doing different things, essentially. We, we always used the AWS cloud, but they were kind of rolled differently. Um, so there was no unification there. And when we bought, uh, went into it, acquired Athletics, that was kind of the expertise, right? We were, we were heading in the direction of containerization um, and using Kubernetes, but we found very quickly that we didn't have the expertise and the quickest solve there was to kind of bring that in to our organization. So I wasn't involved directly in that, but I was around and close to it. I, I can tell you exactly, yeah. And so the genesis of it was that we kind of hit some roadblocks with how we could take it as far as we needed to go. And that really helped us, you know, unblock that. Yeah, for sure. Do you think these days there's because i mean at that time there wasn't as much expertise around this stuff right i mean you guys were creating it from from the ground up effectively and and tapping one of the few resources where you could get it do you think there's more support and help 
you know, today, if you want to get started with it? Oh, yeah, I think we, when this like, acquisition happened, it's kind of late 2018 or so. Um, I think 2018, Kubernetes itself matured, right? And you, you started yeah. to get the real community and the documentation. Everything is, yeah, today, if you're starting today, there's a lot more available to you, for sure. You still, you know, want that sort of expertise in-house. So you either build it or buy it, right? That's kind of yeah. the organizational thought there. So in, in our case, we uh, sort of brought it in, in-house. Yeah, for sure. It's uh, always more fun to build and it. I, <laughs> at at into it, we have a dedicated platform engineering team, right? And that sort of, and we are able to work with our internal uh, developers to understand their pain points and sort of build a platform that is spe very specific to into it, whether it's compliance and security needs or just developer needs or anything in between. Um, but the, the space right now, so what we did was basically an acqui hire of, hey, you know, let's take the, these guys that are really well versed in cloud native um, and software delivery practices and bring it into into it. But it, 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 and and be part of this platform engineering team, right? But if 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 you're not the size of Intuit, and if you're if if you don't have uh, the need to build your own platform engineering team, then definitely in 2023 there are several solutions, managed services or solutions that are available that that can be utilized. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Now you you mentioned something I want to uh, tap into here for a second. You said, you know, you have a dedicated platform engineering team and, and obviously Intuit is a pretty large company. So you have the benefit of, you know, kind of being able to separate responsibilities. Now, as part of, you know, this GitOps process, do you tend to like embed a platform engineer with development teams uh, when they're running through projects or is it more like that team is setting standards? Yeah, it's the latter. So we're basically a centralized platform engineering team and we're trying to get ourselves as much and whatever we deliver as much as possible abstracted from the end user. So the the division of responsibility of what a service needs versus what we provide is very crystal clear and we don't have to embed platform engineers in service teams. So that's the idea of building like a stricter isolation and division of responsibility between the two. Sure. And in our team, we started from the day one is we're building a product, right? And it's more like a SaaS model where we, here's a product and teams can use it. Um, there are some white glove experience there, but it's not embedded in that team. Okay. Yeah, really, really interesting. And I think there is this concept that a lot of teams would love to get to, right? The idea of like the golden process, the golden pipeline, uh, where you can easily set the standard, hand it off to a team and it's all self-service, right? Um, I think that's where everyone wants to get to. I often find that the reality is somewhere in the middle there, um, but that's just kind of the nature of changing, you know, architectures and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, thanks for the insight on that. Now, I, I think yeah. we've already, yeah, go ahead, Anusha. Yeah, please. I was just going to say that there are about 2,500 plus services that are running on our platform and we manage about 260 Kubernetes, mid-sized Kubernetes clusters with more than 20,000 namespaces. So it wouldn't scale if we had to put a platform engineer in every one of the 2,500 services. So all the more there is very heavy investment in, hey, how do we do this you know, uh, golden path or paved road onboarding and yeah. sort of have clear sort of guidelines on how how to use the service. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think you already, you know, mentioned that obviously GitOps is its core to your process at Intuit, right? It's a it's a key component of it. Now you use it for a lot of stuff, not necessarily just the applications, right? Because you're using it for infrastructure and things like that. Is it an integral part of your CI CD process? Like could your CI CD process function without it today? No, it's super in integral to our, our um, especially our platform and infrastructure needs. Um, I can walk you through an example of how critical this is uh, in keeping our clustered fleet up to date. 
So like I mentioned briefly, like there are about 260 Kubernetes clusters that we manage um, along with a whole bunch of other infrastructure components. But these clusters are integral. They, they are the ones that are running uh, your uh, pods that are basically your services and your service mesh. They are observable. Um, they have API gateway having north south traffic. So there is, it's like, and they're, and all of the Intuit financial services, right? So whether it's TurboTax, Mint, um, uh, QuickBooks, and you name it, right? Like all of these are running in these clusters. So we have to keep them like almost 99.999% reliable. There is no downtime that's fast, that, 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 is, that we can afford to have. They have to also be compliant and secure all the time, right? Which is why we actually build this Kubernetes platform, but we slap in like about 30 plus cluster add-ons to keep it up and running and secure and cost optimal, right? Because yeah, nobody wants uh, expensive clusters. So, yeah. um, so we take care of all all of those uh, angles. But but the key to it is, you know, we when it comes to security, we have to rotate out these clusters every thirty days. Right? Sure. That's how strict our compliance requirements are, and we heavily rely on. Uh, this GitOps model for cluster management. And for example, let's say, and we're a um, AWS shop, so we'll get an AMI every 30 days. And every 30 days, uh, we're not going to spend manpower doing this, right? It's so automated that we actually have a repo, a mono repo just for cluster management. And then they have configurations for each of the clusters. And if and all of their those AMIs are going to be the same version, right? Yeah. Uh, because they have to be compliant. So it's a matter of a, one platform engineer making one uh, commit and one PR, getting it reviewed by two people, and boom, right? Like, and that's it. When it gets merged, um, Argo CD we run Argo CD controller that that's watching this, and then looks at something. Hey, say there's a difference. Now let me go and update the CRs. For in in for all of these clusters, and the, it triggers the air node rotation, and the AMIs are updated in like within a day, and you get status updates um, based on different dashboards, and you can actually look to see. So it's that is how much of automation we have thanks yeah. to GitOps and Argo CD, right? Uh, um, we also use it for. Things like AWS GitOps, where you can we can we store AWS resources and chappies and things like that in uh, GitOps uh, in Git, GitHub repos. Uh, we also do alert management, uh, configuration of uh, Prometheus alerts, configuration of wave like we have a observability vendor called Wavefront, and we store those in there as well. So almost everything that we we try and touch uh, from a platform perspective, we try to use GitOps. Uh, because it's almost essential for managing the scale that we are, that we're handling. Yeah. And, and I mean, just imagine the sheer, you know, amount of hours that you'd have to spend if that part wasn't automated, it would be crazy. And, uh, you know, 30 days is, is obviously it, it feels like a lot, like if you're looking at that process to have to rotate every 30 days, but for a company that works with very secure data, like you guys have to you know, that's absolutely essential. So I don't think you can get away from that process. So you either have way more staff to try to handle the keep the lights on stuff and handle rotations and all that, or you automate the process away, right? Um, and obviously there's other benefits. So we got a really interesting question in line with this, uh, which is you were talking about rotating the clusters every 30 days. It's a mono repo. Is the idea that you have a promotion for different environments like dev stage prod, or is there also a concept of like burn in as things are getting rotated around? Or can one of you guys touch on that a little bit? Yeah, I think maybe I can jump into that. So the promotion, I mean, it's a cycle of uh, pre-prod to prod um, that we have. And so we have set, a, a, our, set up our fleet as kind of pre-prod clusters and production clusters. And what will happen is we'll roll out slowly kind of in uh, waves and, and basically promote that change out. And it's usually not us actually, to touch on the previous point Anisha was talking about, like now that it's all GitOps, we basically have these support and production engineering teams that kind of handle those problems. Like their specific problem is to roll out this AMI change across the fleet. There's a team 
that just takes that responsibility off our plate. And the support engineers, right, that commit like different changes, like uh, configuration changes. It's all unified in one place in the GitOps uh, repo. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And like, I guess the one thing that I hear that I really like too is you have multiple people contributing to this too, right? Because you have the security team that has their own requirements and they're getting into, again, the same repo, the same source of configuration so that everyone kind of knows what's in that change set and it makes it very clear what's in those environments, right? Uh, it's just, I think getting there is what a lot of people want to do. It's it's that process of just, I think, investing in that, right? To to make all of that change happen. Um, yeah, oh. absolutely. Yeah, the, the one thing I wanted to point out too is um, we are able to, because of, we talked a bit about the infrastructure GitOps that we have, but even at the service level, we use GitOps for scanning and security purposes as well. Sure. So for example, when we had to migrate from Kubernetes 121 to Kubernetes 122, um, some of you might know Kubernetes 122 broke a lot of APIs because they decided <laughs> to deprecate some, some, some pretty important ones, right? Like Ingress V1 beta one, for example, right? So all we had to do was, um, Basically, on um, like to see the blast radius of how how many people are still using the older APIs, right? So we actually wrote a script to scan and uh, our end user repos to see uh, how how much was the impact, and we could target those teams to basically go and migrate them over to the new versions yeah. before we ended up migrating the clusters themselves. Sure, and then you guys sign off on it basically from that point. Uh, like if yeah, we run another scan. Yeah, basically we'll run another scan, uh, and then once we see no, no, no one else, then we go ahead and upgrade it. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a cool idea. And and we got another interesting follow up question because you were mentioning Kevin the different teams that have input here. Uh, Jan yeah. asks, do you use a Git owners idea as to who reviews and approves changes? You know, how do you ensure that the reviews are done properly? Uh, is there a separate team like SRE that's actually managing this stuff? Yeah. So we, I mean, we have in that code. Base and the repo is is a code owners uh, list. Generally, it's our our main our platform engineers and our group. Um, but there are a few platform clusters, right? We run platform a platform um, teams. So one of those like ma the machine learning group and the you know we have other data uh, focused groups that they want to control basically the the timing and and more of the have more control of how they get upgraded essentially. So they take control there and. The, there is that model there for them. So they have to approve any change um, that comes in as a PR. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And then, you know, another question came in that's very topical here as well. So you've mentioned managing so many different clusters, environments. Argo today doesn't have a single pane of glass. That's it above all of that. So how do you get insight into all of that today? Yeah, we built our own. <laughs> okay. That's a, yeah, that's a we, common theme that we hear quite a bit. Um, I mean, that's what, you know, that's one of the reasons that we built that at CodeFresh is we had customers asking for the same thing. It's like when you're managing, especially people who are working with, you know, diverse environments or customers, right? External customers, they have so many different Argo instances. How do you actually get insight into that? Um, do you think that's ever going to come to the open source or is it more like the the build your own stuff? Um, so the we we call it a cluster manager, uh, but basically it's, it manages a fleet of clusters. It basically manages the two sixty and odd clusters, and um, uh, we don't intend to uh, open source it because it's very intuitized. So gotcha. it plugs in with our security model. It plugs with our onboarding model. It it, it has a very opinionated way of. Uh, defining uh, what a Kubernetes namespace is, and it slaps in some restrictions on like limit ranges, resource quotas, and things like that. So it's pretty opinionated. We haven't sort of thought much about like how it can be um, generalized enough to be open sourced at this point. Sure. Didn't mean to put you on the spot, but figured it's worth asking. <laughs> yeah, I think there was like uh, our, our Argo C. The team, there is a team inside of Intuit that works directly on Argo CD, like full time. Um, they may be thinking about that. I think, no, it's a not, 
basically close to what we do because we we have a unique problem. We do need tight controls. And I think even if we had a feature in Argo CD, it would be kind of a loose um, control thing. So yeah, we, we're probably going to stick with what we have. But that's always the case, right? You're going to have to have some kind of flavoring on top of your um, stuff, especially at Intuit here. We never have taken anything directly off the shelf and just plug yeah. it in. We have to configure it to our needs. Yeah, everything's always customized, right? At the end of the day, for any large company, I feel like, you know, if from my my past coming from a company where everything we bought, you spend another month, two, three months, you know, building it exactly the way that you need to use it. Uh, so I can understand that sentiment. So, you know, we know that GitOps is obviously crucial to your process. You said you could not do your CI CD without it. You know, in your day to day, what are like just a few of the biggest, you know, improvements that you've seen from implementing GitOps or utilizing GitOps in your day-to-day -day role? Uh, for, for us, it's primarily managing the Kubernetes clusters. Um, like I mentioned, uh, the cluster lifecycle, um, the alert management, uh, being able to hand off the entire process to a sister team like the SRA team to say, hey, you know, why don't you guys sort of start contributing? Because actually that has happened. But we used to own this end to end as a platform team. Now our sister team, the SRA team is actually taking care of it because it's that um, the process is so well, uh, well automated and it's like a well oiled machine that mm -hmm. uh, and it's and and we we will review it once in a while, but it's almost like you know it, it's it's on cruise control, um, sure. and and I think that that's uh, that's the beauty of this whole um, this whole process. If you do it right and do it well, then we can definitely um, see all the benefits. Of course, not everything can be GitOps, right? Like there have been some sure. use cases where we've thought that, hey, you know, this, we don't want to expose this as a GitHub repo to whoever, whatever persona it is, because it doesn't make sense. We have to abstract it even further, maybe provide a CLI or like a user interface so that they don't have to worry whether something is reconciling in the back or not, and they need a definitive answer, right? So um, uh, there have been there have been those cases as well, but uh, yeah, for the most part, it's all of the cluster and uh, platform lifecycle management that we're using it for. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And Kevin, would you agree? You have anything to add about that, or? Yeah, I do definitely agree. I think we've touched a lot on it. That you know, it, it's taken uh, a while to get to that point, but it's now at a point where it's like on cruise control, and and we get that time back to do a lot of innovation, innovation into the product itself, right? And, we don't have to manage uh, the get those pieces. Other teams are actually started to taking ownership there. So yeah, it's nice to to have where it's everything centralized around this GitOps model, right? And everybody agrees to that and integrates there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And all right, let's go to the other side of this. What has GitOps made harder for you guys? <laughs> so. Um... I, I maybe Kevin has some details uh, about how uh, how the pre GitOps into it looked like, but uh, from from when I have uh, been here, uh, it's been pretty uh, well accepted. I think the culture the the culture to the the engineering culture already has had adopted GitOps as a good delivery mechanism. So so engineers always felt like, hey, it's perfectly normal to actually you know, raise a comment, raise a PR, get it reviewed rather than, hey, like, oh, why am I asking a whole bunch of people to, you know, uh, for approvals to get this done? Why am I checking sure. in this? Why can't I just go to use Coop config, uh, Coop cuddle, and then edit the thing directly, right? Like, uh, th that was that mindset was not 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 there when I saw, but maybe maybe Kevin can add to, hey, you know, what it what it took to get the culture here. Yeah, I think uh, um, just the, the pain point I think we even see today is it's the PR process itself. It, it's chasing a lot of PRs right now. At our scale, yeah. we we have um, tens and twenties and even hundreds of commits a day, depending on what's going on. Um, and somebody has to go in and approve those and merge them. 
um, usually the team who's making the change. And even like now we allow certain team members like to the app team to make changes, but yeah, we have to approve it and, and then, uh, then they can merge it. So I think that's the major thing that I see still, uh, is sort of the process, um, of, of having so much change in one place. Uh, it is taking time there. I think for the previous, like before GitOps, we used essentially what you would think you would use, right? You kind of have some automation there through sort of a, like a GitOps way, but more like just like a Jenkins or something. And, or, and then we did build our cluster management and namespace management tools, and it was a database driven thing. So our changes went into that database. So once we went to GitOps, we just basically broke that database and put it back and make it uh, completely. I don't think the process of life cycle changed at all. It's more of how we, you know, how to, yeah, model it and train people to do the PRs instead of, hey, update this, um, you know, form in somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. So the one thing I had is um, for all of these GitOps repos, we actually have con at least one, if not more, controllers that are constantly being managed and updated and they're listening for all of these changes and then deploying them to like a target environment, right? Sure. So we are the team that actually writes, builds and maintains it. Now, um, that is additional responsibility. Uh, and you, you uh, I, I remember, for example, the cluster GitOps controller um, was to uh, to get to the stable state that it is in today was a journey, right? Like it was not bug free right away. So somebody would raise a PR, get it merged, and mm -hmm. figure out that the cluster upgrades were not kicking in, for example, right? And then some mm -hmm. like someone from our team had to go in and debug it and look at like what is the target state? Why is it not taking? Oh, maybe because the code didn't actually account for this new configuration. A parameter that was introduced oh now we have to sync up and so on so there is there is a maintenance burden that goes with with having this GitOps model right it does it's not yeah. it's not free you have to have something some piece of software listening in for your differences and reconciling and and then you need to have people write and maintain that so that's that and and, and if you if you can't then that's a friction right that's a friction point yeah absolutely and that's in addition to like the, having that even being maintained is in addition to the cultural change that you were talking about earlier, right? You have to get the developer teams to buy in that this is part of your process now. Right? You have to update that. Um, you have to live within kind of the guardrails that are set up. Um, I mean, personally, I've been on both sides of it, so I know that the other side is way more painful, but I still think getting people to buy in that they should actually adopt it is challenging, right? That they know that they're going to, hey, maybe the developers are doing a little bit more work on sort of the the GitOps, DevOps slash CI, CD side than they were previously, but they're also going to spend a lot less time chasing things in environments where they don't actually know what's going on, right? What's actually deployed out there um, or that their environment's not ready, right? Their cluster isn't in place or it's not set up the way they expect. Um, so definite trade-offs. Uh, I We hear the cultural stuff all the time. So to me, that is, uh, that's a tricky one because it's different at every company, right? They they might be able to very easily get buy in, let's say, in like an architecture group that is supposed to set standards, but then the development groups are going to fight them <laughs> every step of the way. Or it could be a very, you know, progressive company or maybe like a startup atmosphere where just anything new, they're like, let's do it, let's do it, let's do it. So it's just, it varies, it varies heavily, but um, that was really good insight. And uh, I think in general, the one point that you made that I, I do want to repeat, which is these things take maintenance. So even the culture is there, the developers, the platform engineers, everyone's ready to make these changes on every time that they need to. Um, you still have someone that has to maintain that. They have to maintain the GitOps tooling, the reconciler, you know, the repo structure. Uh, to your point, a lot of like the AWS resources that you guys deal with, someone still needs to maintain that and understand the life cycle and kind of fit it in somewhere. And I think that's really tricky. It's almost easier to comprehend when you're not doing GitOps because uh, you don't have to put it down somewhere and someone with the knowledge would just go in and do it, but it's way more dangerous, right? <laughs> so so it's like, it's it's an interesting conundrum. Um, so that was great. Uh, thank you for, you know, the feedback on that. That, that was really cool. Uh, let me just kind of jump in here and say, and this was actually something that we got in Q&A earlier. 
Um, but how much do you expect your developers to actually know about that CI CD process? Because you said there's some cultural change they have to commit to repos. You know, how aware do they have to actually be on this? Uh, and we'll start with you, Kevin, on this one. I think from uh, from the app developer um, perspective, that's been a little bit of a challenge right there. We've kind of leaked a lot of Kubernetes to them. Um, essentially, on our model, they, they get a little deployment repo, so it's kind of isolated repo where they have all the resources just for Kubernetes. Um, and we're kind of looking at solving that in a better way currently to abstract more of that away from the developer. So that, cause it has been a challenge to, you know, what's an ingress, what's, how does this all work together? Um, I think people are aware of the pipeline. The pipeline is very, you know, as you would kind of visualize it, right? It's a pre-prod to prod prediction pipeline and has some, you know, gates in, in between there, but, uh, essentially when you get to a problem stage you have to have some expertise things like oh well, this config didn't pass right because that's when we get support call <laughs> and yeah um, i think yeah we're we're more than and i should get to speak more to like thinking rethinking that piece of it, of it. yeah so like anyone mentioned Exposing direct Kubernetes YAMLs to service developers was not a good idea. Um, <laughs> yeah, I've seen that before. Uh, earlier, we would um, expose like an app repo, a config repo, and then a deployment repo. And your deployment repo is actually your bare Kubernetes manifest. You could actually take those YAMLs and then deploy it yeah. using Kubernetes, and it'll work. Right, and then what we were doing was that deployment repo was what Argo CD would monitor, and then for changes, and every time a new build was made, then that would actually continuously deliver it to our environments. The problem with that is it has a strict dependency to the Kubernetes platform. So what happens if your Kubernetes version change, which we change every three to four months, Mm -hmm. and um, and they're constantly breaking upstreams constantly like you know they guarantee only n minus three version com backward compatibility so if you had if you were in 122 and you had a 119 yeah well, you're gonna there's no guarantee that there is going to be any compatibility right so we had to constantly raise prs to their repos just saying oh you have to now update your api versions and you need to actually update your um the spec uh, to act, be compliant with the latest version, so then we can go ahead and update because we don't want to break their um, services. But and this was a pretty heavyweight process. We would send out these things called service, technical service bulletins. People would have to read it, and then we have to just get them to. Uh, we'll raise PRs, and then have to still merge it, and and it was a long process, and would have, with a very long tail. And uh, that, that, this was a huge problem. The other thing is people will just say like, oh, I have HPA. What is HPA? I don't know what HPA is. Let me look it up. And they'll just Google something. They'll put in random numbers in there. And like, okay, <laughs> um, then 50 max 500, whatever, right? Like, and that's like, they don't even know what what what, what it is because that's not their subject matter. They're not a subject yeah. matter expert in Kubernetes. Yeah. They're a subject matter expert in the financial services business logic and writing Java code, right? So um, this was also causing a lot of friction. So again, like going back to what our org's charter is, which is, you know, increasing developer velocity, this was all causing friction and uh, pro prohibiting them from having good velocity, right? So the, there is a new um, sort of initiative that like Evan and I and the broader team are working on, which is basically how do you provide application abstraction for and for our developers right instead of exposing yeah. a big kubernetes yaml or you know cloud resources they should be able to provide their intent and that's it they should just say hey you know i'm running a particular app and 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 here is a docker image and then just go deploy it right like as simple as that and we'll have to basically do everything else. We manage their HPA, we manage their service mesh, we manage their ingress, we just tell them, hey, here is your um, endpoint for north south traffic and east-west traffic, and that's it. That's all that they will get, that, that they will get back and have to manage. So there is there is that, that um, it's a voice work in progress and we're learning a lot along the way, um, mm -hmm. but, but there is definitely, um, that's definitely the direction that we're going towards is less, Kubernetes and cloud leakage into 
application owners. But uh, to to follow up on what's happening today, so that's kind of the future. But today is we do have like this kind of like a Jedi program, which is essentially an advanced training for, of of usually we say send somebody from the business unit to get this subject subject matter expertise in your close to your teams, and that person would help um, the teams um, to to make changes there. But yeah, as we saw, that kind of breaks down as well if that person leaves or, or you know, moves to another yeah, position. Yeah, that, that's awesome. As a big Star Wars fan, I like that it's the Jedi program, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's very cool. And it, yeah, I mean, you guys touched on so many good points. Um, you know, developers, to your point, Anusha, it's, it's not their core focus to learn about Kubernetes, to learn about kind of the details behind a lot of this stuff. And it's not what they're measured on usually, right? They're measured on feature development. and and working their story points and, you know, really working with their product managers uh, at the end of the day to make sure that that stuff gets delivered in. But a lot of times they like to hand it over <laughs> and have someone else take care of it. So it's finding that right level of abstraction that I think is tricky in a lot of places. Now, it sounds like you guys are, you know, evolving your process at Intuit to figure out what is that right level. And I think, you know, every company has to kind of go through that process. I, I will say in general, one thing that you mentioned, though, uh, which jumps out right away is, yeah, your developers don't want to deal with Kubernetes YAMLs. Uh, so that's like, that's a sage piece of advice because I see a lot of companies struggle with this where they're like, well, you know, we hired what we think were full stack developers and that means that they want to learn Kubernetes and they have no problem building out a Kubernetes YAML or a Helm chart and doing this. But the reality is that that isn't really included in that for most of those folks, right? That's not something that they're going to develop their expertise in. And they just see it as a burden to delivering that stuff. So I would strongly advise to people out there considering adopting this. Keep in mind, you still don't want them to really have to fully understand what a, uh, you know, what a volume claim is on Kubernetes, how to, you know, intimately manage a, a secret or how to intimately manage like the gateway connection in Kubernetes and how it deals with their application. You still have to have some level of abstraction there that makes sense for them and helps to enable them to move quicker without necessarily, you know, requiring so much knowledge from them. All right, so that that was great. Um, so let's move on to, actually, there was a really interesting question here. So uh, in regards to the cluster manager that you kind of, you kind of built uh, homegrown, did you build your own cluster manager? Or did you leverage something like cluster API to happen to all of your Argo instances that you did? It's a good question. So um, we developed this cluster manager way before cluster lifecycle, the cluster lifecycle existed. So this is um, this predates this uh, cluster API and cluster lifecycle manager that's out there in the Kubernetes things. So we have a, we wrote our own. And uh, we we don't uh, plan to leverage the. We've actually looked into it. Sure. We looked into it. We've explored it, and we realized that uh, uh, this is not a good fit for our needs. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, it would be a cool path to go down for sure. Um, I'm not sure if. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I remember we looked at it when it was in the alpha phase, where it was uh, you couldn't mutate. The cluster object to begin with. So that's how they started out. And that was a big no no for us to begin with. And the and by, by then we had all the features set built out already. So to basically go to cluster API, alpha, and non-mutating objects was a basically a huge step back for us. So that's the one reason why we didn't. And now we are, yeah, we we, we don't see a reason to basically throwing what we have and about something new. Yeah. yeah. I think uh, to add to Anisha's points there, we, we've we always actually, from day one, we've started with a cluster config. So it's actually a, a very, you know, Kubernetes-like spec um, that we have to define the clusters. And that's really worked out in our favor for managing the fleet, but it is definitely into it specific in a lot of ways. And so to adopt, and we've watched, yeah, these open source things and the cluster API and other APIs like that, that, you know, can 
make us more conformant, but then we can't do certain things and, and or extend that very cleanly. And so we chosen to stick with our own um, cluster config, basically. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so I got an interesting question, uh, which you know is is one that I think comes up a lot, which is how would you explain to an organization the difference between DevOps and now GitOps? You know, what are differences and what are the same? So it's a really it's a big question. Uh, the first thing would be DevOps is the all encompassing thing, right? That that you know GitOps lives inside of your CI/CD process lives inside of your application delivery, the build and delivery process is all going to live inside of that. GitOps itself is a set of principles. Um, and you can actually go to open GitOps, and it's something that Intuit and CodeFresh and a bunch of other uh, you know technology companies have put together on how to follow like the core GitOps principles on your software delivery process. And so, to me, GitOps is really a set of defining best practices or principles that lives within your DevOps process, and it brings with it a ton of benefits, as we've already talked about some complexity, but a ton of benefits to traceability, um, to reliability, you know that kind of stuff. So I would highly recommend going to check out Open GitOps. Like I said, you know, a lot of companies out there, technology companies, have contributed to that. Uh, it's an open source thing, so you can get involved with it. Uh, yep, Dan just threw the link in there, and that should give you a really good idea on how to kind of uh, separate the two. But then also, it should give you something that you can hand off to your organization to say, "This is what GitOps does. You know, it's going to live with our process. Uh, it's part of our DevOps, and here's the best practices to follow." Okay, so just a time check, we have about 10 minutes left. Um, but I do want to get into some fun stuff here. So do you use progressive delivery? Are you doing canary blue green? Um, and I guess if you are, you know, how are you ensuring the health of those applications when they get delivered out? Um, yeah, I think it started. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, of course, we are doing progressive delivery. Um, we use Argo rollouts to achieve it. Um, so what, what Argo rollouts does is re, it's like a replacement for the native Kubernetes deployment controller that comes out of the box, but provides some, some more sophisticated ways of deployment. So you can provide strategies such as blue green, you can assign percentages to how much your canary want, you want your canary to deploy and then watch the canary before you upgrade your entire fleet um, and things like that. So in fact, our uh, delivery pipeline doesn't use the standard uh, deployment object anymore. It actually uses the rollout object. Okay. And we also have built in um, analysis uh, runs and analysis templates. So that goes in hand with rollouts. And the way that analysis uh, runs work is you can identify the health of a rollout and see how well the rollout is progressing. And if the rollout is erroneous for some reason, and you can measure it in different parameters, but let's say that you're measuring it on HTTP error rates, then you can actually have analysis run say, hey, you know, if the error rate goes beyond a particular um, threshold, then you can actually roll back automatically so that you don't have a bad rollout in production, for example. Um, so, so we have, uh, in short, uh, yes for progressive delivery, yes for um, having having it deployed across uh, into it in production. Yeah, that's great. And so I guess to touch on that, because you said you don't want to have a bad deployment into production. So you might do a rollback, right? And and if it's part of your rollout process, it can be automated. But I guess to follow up on that, you know, how do you handle your promotions between environments right now? Is that automated? Um, is it a gated process? Uh, Kevin, do you want to touch on that a little bit? Yeah, I, that's part of the overall paved road pipeline that we give to the team. So do we have when you get a, like a service, you kind of create your service, you get your your repos and your pipeline is all generated for you. And that's all the way to production. Um, and there are some gates, right? Before you go to production, you have to have security, you know, check off things for you and make sure you're ready. Uh, but once you're doing that, yeah, it's all automated all the way out to production. Um, you can introduce your own custom gates as well. You kind of control that pipeline, but from a templated, like vended point of view, it's it's a full pipeline um, and it's from like QAL to, you know, we have a QAL and, uh, and E2E and then we go to prod. 
yeah, that's three or four environments. That's pretty cool. Do you think that that is achievable for most companies? Yeah, I believe so. It's these are like separate namespaced environments that we pr provide to them. So it's a model. I think it's a very generic model, right? Even before Kubernetes, I was we were doing this at Intuit and other companies that I've looked at, sort of done very similar, right? You have some sort of pre-prod environments, and then you have your main production environment. Um, so there's nothing new about it. I think any company can achieve the same thing. Uh, whether the the thing is, we do spend a lot, and there's a cost concern there in our pre-prod. <laughs> So we do test <laughs> quite a bit, and that's just an Intuit, right, fintech thing. So, you know, companies may want to spend a little less than we do. Sure. Do you guys do, like, load testing as well as part of this process, or is that separate, or? Yeah, there is a performance environment as well. E2E is, is tested pretty heavily. Nice. Yeah, yeah, that definitely makes sense. Um, and, I mean, I, I do think it's, personally, I think it's a level of, you know, automation that is achievable by companies, you know, as long as they're willing to invest the time. Uh, and in some cases, to your point, Kevin, maybe the resources and cost as well. Because I think, you know, unfortunately, what I've seen working with a lot of folks is they will have a staging or pre -prod or pre prod environment, and they'll not necessarily give it enough resources to truly be uh, a true analog to the production environment. And it, it can lead you into situations that you didn't know you were gonna have trouble with, right? You know, whether it's, um, you know, you didn't, Actually test with enough API hits or whatever it is. Response time goes crazy, or you're hitting the database too hard, or vice versa. Uh, so it it is kind of a a balance for companies to determine: can we spend that money to make sure we have a bulletproof staging environment? And then I think if you do, to your point, Kevin, you know there is a cost concern there, but it can help smooth that process up into the other environments for sure. Agreed. Great. Um, so we've already talked a lot about how you guys are using GitOps to manage your infrastructure. Is there any like quick tips that you would throw out there to, to give to people who are also looking to start that process? Um, Go ahead, Nisha. I would say get started uh, as soon as possible. If you are working in a microservice cloud native environment, and because the volume of change is quite explosive and also depends on your scale. Um, sure. For us, the scale is huge and the number of uh, moving parts is just a lot. So this is, was a natural solution for us. So if you have, if you have a reasonably big environment and scale, uh, go, go, go invest in, in GitOps for sure. And and I think the second thing is have your engineering teams um, build the right culture and mindset for GitOps because it's not free. It's not mm -hmm. it's not like you can take a training. And it's basically a mindset change and also building the right tool set along the way and being able to maintain that tool set. So th th be ready to invest in those. Yeah, absolutely. Do uh, you have anything to add to that? Oh, and of course, uh, use Argo CD. Yeah, I was going to say that. Use Argo, right? <laughs> Argo CD is the right choice. Exactly. Yeah, wearing an Argo shirt, so I agree. <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess, you know, we're we're just about to wrap up here, but let's let's end with a bombshell. So uh, this is for both of you guys. Um, we can start with you, Anusha. Is GitOps right for every engineering org? Like I mentioned, it depends on how big and how big your teams are and how scalable uh, you are. And hopefully you're doing microservice based uh, architecture and, and, and delivery. Um, and if that is all true, then yes, it is the right choice. But you see the microservices as that's a dependency basically to go down this process in your opinion? So if you if you're a monolith, in my opinion, if you're a monolith and you already have a software delivery process with like some sort of homegrown scripting slash tooling, because some some orgs still do that and they're happy mm -hmm. with it. If it's not interfering with your software delivery process and your agility, then I feel like you you don't need to rock the boat. But more and more companies and teams are gearing towards microservice models and agile delivery processes, and they want to modernize their stack, right? More than anything, they, will, they want to 
even going from monolith to microservices is a modernization strategy right yeah. like, but if there, there are still teams that are not modern modernizing their stack they, and and just so gitops is just one part of modernizing so if you, if, if you haven't modernized your stack then gitops is going to be a hard sell i think superfluous right <laughs> yes. um, what, yes. what do you think kevin yeah i think if you're just starting fresh definitely go with GitOps. If you are sort of migrating to it, um, yeah, think about it a little bit, I guess, what that means to you. I agree with Anisha's point that we have monoliths. Right? We we run them on our, and they're running GitOps fine, but it did take a lot of change um, to get them on board. And so it was a long transition as well, um, just to break what they want to do, right? They want to always usually keep their old environments up and then have this new GitOps way. Um, so yeah, you have to evaluate. It's every case by case. Yeah, yeah, that totally makes sense. Um, and unfortunately, this has been lovely. Uh, and Anusha and Kevin, and I thank you so much for joining today. It was a very enlightening conversation, but we are actually out of time here. Uh, so Anusha, Kevin, anything that you want to shout out that you have coming up in the near future? Like, are you going to be at KubeCon or you guys have talks coming up that you want to uh, rep? Uh, <laughs> I do have a talk in KubeCon. Um, so if you're in KubeCon EU, uh, come hear us talk about uh, how we're doing observability and AI ops. Um, yeah, it was a pleasure talking to Brandon and uh, looking forward to more collaboration. Yeah, absolutely. Um, nice. Kevin, how about yourself? Yeah, likewise, I, I may have a blog or two. Uh, we may, we'll see if we get in another talk circuits around, but yeah, nothing much. <laughs> I'm just kind of a, a strategic, I mean, a tactical person here and into it. And we're working on a lot of things. Yeah, well, it was, it was great. Um, and I mean, Kevin, the tactical people are essential to this process of this conversation. Uh, cause you, both of you are deeply involved in the implementation, which is crucial. You know, people need to hear about what other companies are doing. Um, I guess to plug a little bit of our own stuff, so we do have episode three of Merging Domain coming next month, and that will actually be tackling CI/CD secrets. Uh, so that's another hot topic that is debated constantly and not really a solved problem, in my opinion. I can drop the link in chat. Uh, we also have several talks at KubeCon EU, so if you happen to be in EU, please stop in. Um, and again, just thank you so much, Anusha and Kevin. Uh, we really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.